My beloved clergy, it is with paternal and pastoral love that I reach out to you on behalf of the Holy Eparchial Synod to thank you, to thank you for your tireless efforts serving our people during this ongoing pandemic crisis. We, as the hierarchs of the Archdiocese, are very aware of the many struggles that our clergy are experiencing these days. We have been called to minister during a most extraordinary time in the life of the Church, and the challenges that we face are unique. Among our faithful, we find first responders, medical professionals, and others who continue to face the crisis daily. We find many who have lost friends and loved ones without being able to say goodbye. And we find that many of our brother clergy are dealing with these experiences without fully realizing it. For this reason, we have created a task force to assist you and offer you tools to help you as you respond to the many demands that you are facing. Dear brothers, I keep each of you close to my heart in my prayers day and night. I pray that you will use these videos for your edification and as tools to assist the great number of people that will be calling upon you in the coming weeks and months. May God continue to strengthen and guide each and every one of you at this time and always. In this episode, we will talk about the pastoral care for the dying and the bereaved. The physical presence of the priest at the bedside of the dying, in addition to offering prayers, confession, and the sacraments, provides comfort and solace to those preparing to depart this life. Through gathering together as family and community, the Church's mourning rituals assist the bereaved to navigate the painful grieving process. This pandemic has dramatically altered the normal mourning rituals of our clergy and their parishioners. How pastors provide support and comfort has been challenged. There is restricted access to those who are dying. The normal process of grieving is even more painful for both the clergy and laity. There is heightened loneliness for all involved. As clergy, we know that phone calls or virtual contact is no replacement for our personal presence at a hospital bedside or funeral gathering. Being present is not just what we do, it's who we are. Losing the ability to be present can feel like a loss of meaning, purpose, and identity. During this pandemic, we may come to the logical conclusion that there is no way to provide effective pastoral care, leaving us with a sense of helplessness, disappointment, and insignificance. While we might be restricted in our access to the faithful, the Holy Spirit is not. We must trust that the Holy Spirit can accomplish its work as much in a brief phone call as in a full pastoral visit. It's easy to lose sight of the presence and power of God through the Holy Spirit. Try not to get discouraged by what you're not able to do, but keep your focus on what you can do. With this in mind, your normal pastoral care must take on a new look during these unusual times. Here's what you can do. Step number one, reach out. While you might be very aware of the inadequacy of phone calls compared to personal contact, rest assured that your parishioners will remember for years to come the check-in phone calls they receive from you and from others. Parishioners will feel less alone and will remember that you thought of them through these devastating times. The act of being remembered helps people in their grief. Reach out in creative ways. Reaching out to parishioners during this pandemic requires more intention, effort, and discipline. Take advantage of access through phone calls, video chats, and texting to families of the departed. These communications do not need to be long, but it's good if they are frequent. Ask questions like, how are you spending your day? How are things different since they've departed? What do you miss the most about your loved one? Engage your parish leaders to reach out. Parish council members, philoptokos, and other parish ministry leaders can assist you in maintaining regular contact with grieving families. Ask those who are grieving if they would welcome a call from a parish leader or lay minister. 
May I have someone call you to check in on how you're doing? Consider giving names of parishioners to competent parish council members, philoptokos, or other parish ministry leaders. Guide them to ask how the grieving parishioner is doing, listen to what they want to talk about, and ask if there is anything they need. Remind them to keep you informed about their calls. Encourage the bereaved to reach out to others. Remind those who are grieving that isolation can make the grieving process more difficult. Encourage them to connect with others, relatives, family members, or friends, even if it takes some effort. Step number two, listen, ask about signs and symptoms, and invite sharing of feelings. In addition to listening to the grief and loss of those bereaved, be prepared to hear sadness, disappointment, and frustration around the restrictions in place. Pay attention to and listen for the cumulative effects of losses, stresses, and loneliness on those who are grieving. Some signs and symptoms of internal distress are an increase in alcohol use, overeating or undereating, excessive video gaming, destructive online activity, and drug abuse. These practices serve to temporarily soothe the troubled soul by indulging bodily impulses and desires. You've heard about the freshman 15 for new college students. We can talk now about the COVID-19 for those who unknowingly are eating more when they feel distressed. Step number three, integrate into the life of the church. Particularly when people are experiencing acute pain, silence and your prayerful presence is usually the best response. For some, the death of a loved one can be a wake-up call to rethink how one is living one's life. You don't need to initiate these conversations, but be open to any questions the bereaved might have regarding God's presence and power in the face of death and the pandemic. Consider posting your weekly sermon or offering teachings online through live video talk, webinars, podcasts, or online Bible study. Devoting episodes specifically to death, grief, loss, and loneliness can supplement the regular pastoral phone calls. Ask for assistance by reaching out to those in your community, like the youth and young adults who are familiar with technology. If you're not able to do this, it's wise to connect your parishioners to types of useful online resources from fellow clergy. Pray for them, pray with them, teach them to pray. For many, prayer is a last resort. You can remind the bereaved that prayer unites us with God and our departed loved ones. Teach that praying for the soul of a loved one nurtures a real connection with the departed and reflects the reality of the power of the resurrection of Christ over death itself. Your ongoing prayers for the bereaved serve to keep you connected to your parishioners as well. Step number four, stay involved. Develop mechanisms for staying connected to parishioners. Set a time each day to specifically call the families who are bereaved. Include video in your call when you're able. Structuring these calls with a schedule will assist with staying on top of these tasks in the midst of the disruptions to your routines. Set up one day a week when you can choose to make porch visits to those who are grieving. Inform your parishioners that you just want to stop by and check in without entering the home. Consider leaving a small baggie with Endither on or a small paper icon with the parishioner. Stay present in their lives through your prayers. Prayer is a powerful means of connecting with God and each other, particularly when we cannot be physically present. Step number five, pay extra attention to your own self-care at this time. Losing the ability to properly care for grieving parishioners represents a real loss to pastors at this time. Pastors are still required to bury the dead, but without the usual mechanisms and routines that they have developed over years of ministry. These routines are an essential part of the pastor's self-care as he walks with families through the bereavement process. This loss of an ability to care for others can feel disorienting. Ask yourself the questions that you're asking your parishioners. Identify your support system. Share how you're doing as much as what you are doing. Share your struggles, disappointments, and frustrations, including any feelings of loneliness. Your vulnerability to these painful feelings is part of your humanity and part of what makes you a great pastor. The better we are at attending to our inner life when we feel weak, the stronger we become. 
Your ministry is one of presence, not problem solving. Problem solving leads to the feelings of failure and emptiness. Simply being present is life-giving. Whether it is the pain of a loved one dying alone or the frustration of inhibited funeral practices, being present with parishioners and their struggles provides real relief. While we cannot take away the unique burdens of pastoral care during this pandemic, we can attend to one another. This is a difficult time, but remember, you are not alone. Welcome. My name is Dr. Philip Mamalakis, the Assistant Professor of Pastoral Care here at Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Here with me today is Father Nicholas Kromilis, the Proistamonos of St. Demetrius Greek Orthodox Church in Weston, Massachusetts. Welcome, Father Nick. Thank you. And Father Chris Fistukas, the Proistamonos of St. Vasilios Greek Orthodox Church in Peabody, Massachusetts. I would like to jump in and right away and just open with uh, a question. How would you say your pastoral care lives have been most changed or most affected from the pandemic? And particularly around how you conduct funerals or you know, care for those who are dying and caring for their loved ones? Obviously, that this COVID situation has turned everything upside down on its head. And um, it's taken many years to kind of either normalize it or, or uh, try to find a rhythm as to what it is that we do, how we comfort people, how we approach people, you know, especially during uh, times of a death in their families and, and loved ones. Uh, the COVID situation has changed everything dramatically. Uh, you know, going to church, seeing other individuals, being with others, uh, being called to a home where someone is dying or, or at a hospital or a nursing home and so forth and so on. Those things are not allowed. We usually are not called there. So that in itself is kind of a preparatory, is a kind of an introduction, is a kind of a being and meeting with the family where they are and being present to them. That's all pretty much has disappeared. You know, it's different to talk on the phone and it's different to be there uh, in person. So it begins there, and it doesn't end any better, because frankly, the next thing we know, we are at uh, rarely in the church these days, and just to do a service at the cemetery, which that in itself is out of the ordinary. Usually, uh, the night before, we're in a, a funeral home doing a trisayo with the community present, besides the family being comforted, and we're being there as well. Same thing with the church. Well, so for for me, uh, I think it was Father Nick early on um, when I was a deacon, you know, that told me, you know, to take some time in the morning, you know, before I begin my day for reflection, prayer, um, and and I and so. I, my thing was I would go when I arrived to church and go in the altar, like, you know, trim the vigil light, uh, you know, that kind of thing. And then spend 10 or 15 minutes reflecting, praying in the altar. Well, I'm not there anymore. And so I'm home. And so my routine, you know, isn't in sync. And so it's been hard to do that. I get up and go out in the driveway, get the paper, start reading, you know, the globe and see what's going on. And then, you know, chores and. Uh, so now we are not looking out at a community event, if you will, there's a funeral is that it's the community being brought together to comfort, to be present, to speak, to um, embrace, to do all of those things that are so normal to us. And all of these things pretty much have disappeared. Uh, you're wearing a mask. Um, individuals are socially distant from one another, even family members, uh, no touching, no hugging, no, even our expression is, is not even there because they can't see it, you know, behind the mask. So, uh, it, Everything is, is just 
it feels very, very strange indeed. And, and therefore, how can you not be affected by that? Just by the mere fact of uh, what we're used to, what we say, what we do. Uh, and here it is, the situation is, is completely different. So that has an internal impact on us. I, I remember one of the, uh, one of our theologians said that uh, the highest theology is to be present, uh, meaning that the greatest thing that we can offer is to be there, physically there. It's not only a privilege for us as clergy to be there at the most significant moment in this person's life, especially at the end of life, surrounded by loved ones, and to be there as we not only represent ourselves, but the church. And to have that kind of uh, taken away, uh, which is, I think, the greatest strength that we can offer in, in a form of compassion and love, uh, it is a, is a big uh, hurdle to overcome. Well, I mean, in, in terms of um, attending to people who are dying, because as we said earlier that, you know, we generally we're not allowed to have patient contact. Um, and so it is, you know, through a cell phone or some other means, um, you know, praying uh, with the family for the individual, praying with the family uh, about their loved one. I mean, it's been in a remote um, sort of setting. It's not, it's not being physically present. And that's really weird and peculiar uh, for us. I mean, that's not what it is. It's tactile, you know, putting your, you know, your stolen hand on the person or anointing the person, practices and rituals that, that give us meaning and, and make us uh, feel um, useful um, and that, you know, trying to be there for our people in this detached uh, period that we're living in makes it equally difficult to help them and for us to feel good about ourselves that we're in a helping profession and I've helped my parishioners. I mean, so those are my struggles. The strangest thing, though, is, is that um, we're speaking to family members, three, four, five members of the family, that they know this person intimately. And when we have funerals, it's technically the community that is there, friends and others, and we share things that perhaps none of them might know about, or things that they have told us that the family's hearing for the first time. And that is so healing, that is so important. And uh, that too, in many ways, is taken away because you're telling certain facts or certain things about the person's life to the family members that know a heck of a lot more than we could ever know. Uh, anyway, it, it, it's a it's a difficult it's a difficult task. Uh, I compare the two. There's a world of difference. So you, you leave and you walk away feeling as if what what did I offer here? Yes, I offered the funeral service, the words that are so powerful. And then sometimes you know you're even struggling at a cemetery. Father Chris, you may speak to. This. We got some funerals at the cemetery, and people are standing some distance away. There's cars whizzing by. It, it isn't. Has anyone heard that? You know. So it just seems so either formal, so uncomfortable, that you just wonder this piece that speaks to a presence, to comfort, to compassion, to looking at people in, in their eyes, or, or doing some of the things that are so normal uh, to us and natural, all of these things in many ways have been taken away and, and you leave, at least I do, feeling empty and not feeling like I've offered it. Thank you, Father. Father Chris, did you want to add to that or? I, I, I would just say that resonates with me as well with Father Nick said. I mean, it's so uh, extraordinary that, you know, even 
you know, maybe after the funeral, a week later, a couple weeks later, you, you might go visit the family at home, check in or by phone. Um, and now you just, you, I mean, you know, all the normal stuff has, um, has gone by the wayside. And, and you know, I, very early on, I remember even the family wasn't at the, at the cemetery. There was no funeral. Um, the family wasn't uh, there either because everyone was afraid it was me and the undertaker and they um, uh, videotaped like on the phone or whatever it was that did he saw you and, and um, to mail to the family after. It was so surreal. I, I, I mean, who, I mean, for me, it's, I've only been ordained 30 years, but, uh, 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 but to, if you ever said to me 30 years ago that, you know, that this reality that we're living in, you know, one day you'll be doing this, I would have thought, you know, you were out of your mind. I mean, who would do Holy Week without parishioners? Who would do, I mean, it's just so strange. And, you know, we're sort of blind in feeling our way through this process. What are some ways that you've learned how to respond to people who are dying and to their loved ones? And early on, I must say that uh, there was so much time there and it was filled by making phone calls to brother priests and to others. And so, uh, I must say personally that I fell out of that after a month or, or two. I, I just don't do that as much as I did in the beginning. I had time. So there were calls, there were lists, uh, my parishioners, uh, uh, family members that I hadn't talked to and so forth and so on, which was, uh, it was a joy. I could catch up on them. But there's something that happened there that after a while, I, I wasn't doing it as much, or I don't want to say not at all, but just not as often. And therefore, isolation has crept back in. But I don't know how good personally I am to continue to do that, to reach out to others. It to is difficult it. as it as it continues on. It is difficult as it continues on. Father Chris, did you want to add something? I would just echo those. I, I mean, I was smiling because it's the same thing. At the beginning, I was making phone calls and checking in on people and trying to triangulate how things would be and how we can minister and how we can conduct services. It was all this energy um creative energy and doing that stuff but now we've sort of settled into the new normal so i'm not making those phone calls um and the same thing people would call send texts uh, emails how grateful they are and truly they were um i don't want to minimize that but you know even as i have you know sort of dried up in making those those calls uh, so they've you know stopped coming my way uh, as well. But, I mean, they do come now and again, but it's not the same uh, intensity as they were at the beginning. And um, and it's, you know, it's another disconnect. So what do we do? Yes, th there are others, for instance, in our community, we let others know, that if the family wishes, that this person has passed away, that they've, that they've died. And, uh, and through that, they're able to uh, maybe reach out to the family members. Uh, we ask them if they wish to have it streamed because that's another uh, way of uh, connecting, shall we say, and having the community and others be part of that. So, Live streaming the funeral. <clears throat> you give the precious a choice. And many, many have done that. Uh, we encourage others. Sometimes families do not want that. They wanted more of a, a private thing, and, and some are concerned because of COVID, and not to have many, many more people turn up either at the cemetery or, or, or even at the church if we're having services at the church, because uh, we are not able to have more than I mean, early on ten people. So once you let the entire community kind of know. Uh, then it's very difficult to control that people are going to come to the church. So it, there's all of these extraneous uh, things that are part of, of, of a moment that is so intimate, so personal, uh, 
that it, it just the whole thing is just uneasy. It, it just it isn't something that we're used to. Uh, I don't see how we're going to get used to it, Father Chris. But you could speak to this too. So it's um, I'm not sure that, that that we're doing all that we can. We are doing all that we can, but I don't know if that's enough or even measures up to what we can do. What the church does with the funeral service what our pastoral responsibilities speak to us or what we used to do. For me, it's been being available and on call, whether uh, I'm at home like I am right now or um, the, you know, four hours a day I'm in the office to listen to voicemails and, and, and take care of emails and some other things. Um, You know, it, it's it's try, at least you're you're present on on a video or or, or on the phone. I mean, it's something, right? Um, but it's not. It's not the same. It's not my preference. It's something. This is a new reality for at least the near future, and that we're each left with this really dis dis ill at ease feeling like we we can't really do what we're called to do. I'm wondering how we attend to ourselves in ministry if the circumstances are such that we actually are not able to do what we're called to do, which is be fully present. What do we do with that? How do we attend to that so that when we do come out of it, because I think we will, we'll come out of it successfully? A lot of that is uh, what we feel. Um, the question is, what do we do with that? And, and feelings many times, especially in this pandemic, uh, in this world that we're living in now, are, are even more exacerbated by the fact that uh, it's not an easy, a, an easy thing to do, than to share it with others, to meet over a cup of coffee or dinner or lunch, and talk about it to a brother priest or, or someone. Uh, Again, the phone is not, it's just not the same thing. It has, it has to, uh, to do for now, shall we say. But even for most of us, at least for me, uh, when I think about that, I usually pass over it and I keep it to myself. And therefore, it, it grows internally. And it's, uh, it's, it's unsettling. There's just something, uh, there's too much time. We're used to running around doing taking care of other people and doing other things and seeing people and so forth and now there's a sense of loneliness not only our people are feeling but we are feeling and we are being isolated you go into the office and there's a sign saying you know uh, the, the church is closed you know and, uh, and we're not seeing people face to face and all those things that that uh, warm our hearts and give us opportunity for expression for uh, uh, fellowship for reaching other souls and uh, is gone yes the phone works and zoom is a wonderful thing but it, it isn't it isn't the real it's thing. not the same it's, it's not, not the same. same so are you suggesting that you know our normal patterns of connecting and being with people have been removed do we need to be way more intentional about trying to stay connected and there are ways to meet up with people and socially distant are there ways to stay connected with your peers, with fellow clergy, with other pastors in our community, um, with spiritual fathers, so that we stay, that someone, we're sharing with someone what our inner world is like. Because you nicely said, Father Nick, I have a tendency to just ignore it and to push on. And you're saying, this ignoring and pushing on, this is going to be really hard because this is an, this is an unusual burden. Okay. Well, all, all those things are de-isolating, you know, and, and I think that that's the most important thing. Whatever, um, you know, works uh, for a person. Um, and and, the, and the, the other thing is you need to stretch yourself a little bit, you know, and get out of your own comfort zone, which is important. All the strategies are de-isolating, which means whatever it is you do, you know, work towards not being isolated. It's odd. It's unnatural. There's something that seems wrong about this. And it really is acutely experienced 
when we're talking about gathering as church, gathering as uh, bereaved families when lost, there's no other way. It's just odd and it seems almost wrong. And un unfortunately, you know, our ministry is a, a very uh, a, a lonely, I think I mentioned this to you, and it isn't, I don't want to be taken out of context, a lonely business in the sense that we are mainly by ourselves in our offices or doing or conducting a funeral or a hospital. Who are we there except with ourselves? And pretty much there, there isn't anybody by our side looking at us and saying, you know, what, what has been said, what you did, you know, may not, you know, you could do it this way, you could do it that way. So uh, in, in some ways we've fallen into certain patterns. And, and now I think this COVID thing has, uh, has unmasked some of those things and say, what is it that I am doing? And, am I doing it correctly? What more can I do? And as you said, maybe there isn't any more. Or is there a different thing I need to learn how to do? Yeah, that's true too. Father Chris? No, I, I think if there were any, anything, I mean, part of, you know, what I'm, what I'm feeling and what Father Nick has been saying is I think we need to get out of our own comfort zone. And, you know, when things get difficult uh, in the industry, we sort of become like turtles, pull our heads, tails, arms in, and ride it, ride it out. Um, and and I think that's uh, that's not what we should be doing. And at the beginning, we we adapted, but you know, it's not sustained. And we've gone back. I've gone back anyway into my old habits of sort of withdrawing and uh, from waiting for the storm to pass before I peek out of my shell again. And, um, and I think that that's, as Father Nick so eloquently, uh, you know, pointed out is, is not, maybe it's a survive, our own personal survival technique, but it's not healthy for us in the long run. You know, uh, as people as sort of containers, we can only contain um, so much, and then it begins to spill out. Um, and usually it spills out in unhealthy ways. So like, you know, this COVID-19 uh, uh, thing, I mean, we had different routines, walking, going to the health club, uh, whatever it was. And, you know, so for me personally, it's to fall back on, you know, just uh, eating to deal with the stress, which is unhealthy, you know, physically uh, uh, for us. And so, um, I think if we don't empty that stuff, you know, whether it's not just, you know, for me, it's eating for other people. It could be instead of having, you know, uh, a beer or scotch when they got home from work. Now they're having a couple beers or a couple scotches or whatever. I, th I think um, with, you know, lay people and trying to manage somehow, you know, pastoral conversations, confession, whatever. There's, you know, a, a lot more uh, folks turning to pornography um, um, to sort of self-soothe uh, the tension, the stress, the alienation that they're feeling in, in their lives. Um, so, and this can go on in other kinds of ways uh, uh, too, but just, um, I, I think if we don't attend to our stuff as clergy, it begins to manifest itself in, in unhealthy ways. Right. Father Nick, is it too strong for me to say maybe this is our only option because our external circumstances, they don't look like they're gonna be changing in the near future, but we need to change the way our patterns of being a turtle or thinking that we can hold on and hold on. Yeah, we do. We, we do have to, uh, and, and it is a challenge and, and perhaps a great opportunity for that because there are things that uh, we were doing before and that we could claim we're um, either busy or there's too much to do or running around or whatever it is. That excuse goes away with, with the pattern of life the way it is now. And if a virus, a pandemic, can force us 
open up and say, you know what? I am struggling. I'm disoriented. This is overwhelming to me. I feel like I'm not really doing anything. You know, I'm disoriented. I'm at home in my shorts and I'm falling into bad habits. And to recognize that all we need to do is turn to one another and acknowledge it. Is it possible that one of the good things that comes out of that is that it might force us as pastors to stop doing stuff and start reaching out to others and opening up about our struggle? Truth be told, uh, Philip, uh, I don't know, for me at least, I think we're not very good at priests for myself. Uh, we do this with others. I'm not sure either how comfortable or how well equipped or how open we really are. And there might be a reason uh, for that. We can explore that. But basically, I don't think we're that great as, as priests, at least for me, to reach out to others asking, um, you know, for a shoulder to... Uh, uh, to, to share, burn. to write to share, to say some things, or to even ask for help. I hear that from other clergy too. You know, we're not very good at supervision. When after we get into our parishes and our rhythms and so forth, it seems that we, it grows stale. We don't grow, well, at least not share some of the things that are going on that we feel. And really we should know better because this is exactly what our people do. This is, we see how they benefit and how they grow from that. But it seems that we, we are uh, quite content with our, maybe our loneliness, with our... Uh, are you suggesting, Father, that your recommendation would be that the more a priest learns to find those people and those places where he can unburden himself, not necessarily to his wife or only to his wife, because that can be really hard. It might not be the right thing. The better he'll do at being able to navigate these difficulties. Undoubtedly. Undoubtedly. I think that that's true. And I think some of the, uh, the, the things that have crept into our lives to kind of um, lessen the, either the pain, the solitude, the loneliness, uh, are dysfunctional things that are, are, are not as good, you know, uh, they're not as helpful. And that's become the new normal, uh, as Father Chris mentioned about this new normal. Um, and that, it, that's it might the, be the only thing we can do in ministry during the pandemic is learn to share our burdens more because we can't change the environment. It's not ideal. But maybe this is the time where we can try a little bit and open up our hearts a little bit to saying, all right, I need to learn a deeper way or a little more better how to ease my burden because my burden isn't changing and we're not getting out of this. That's true. Uh, you know, early on, we said that this COVID, if there was a blessing, and the blessing was that we had this time to do a number of these things that we wanted to read, perhaps catch up on, uh, on some reading, perhaps reach out to family members and others that we said, perhaps reach out to classmates, schoolmates, and others that we've lost touch with that have brought so much joy into our lives and we shared so many wonderful memories. And, and uh, early on, at least we did that. Can we sustain that? Uh, I feel that I feel that we can't, and maybe that's just more a feeling that I don't want to burden anybody. In, or I made that call. I reached out. Now, before, I wasn't doing that. Every, yeah, the clergy lady we, we meet every two years, you know. Now it feels a little unnatural that somebody that I only saw at the clergy lady, you know, that I'm calling weekly. Imagine if after this whole pandemic passes, what remains is now we actually are more open, more connected, and much better at holding each other's burdens than we were before the pandemic. And what's left, it's kind of a more real, open, connected clergy brotherhood, and by extension, Orthodox parishes. Because you know our parishioners struggle with the same thing, right? Mm -hmm. The mask we're wearing for COVID isn't the first mask we've ever worn to church, right? This is just the mask that's obvious because it's looped around your ears. 
the thing is, it's one thing to say it, it's a whole other thing to do it. And then the question is with who and where do we start? What, you know, what is it that, how do we pick up good habits? You know, isn't it interesting that the bad habits are the things that creep in into our lives, you know, rather than, than, than the good things. Uh, and again, I'm not sure that it's been very helpful with how either busy or how we attend to ourselves or to our minister, to our people, that this opportunity can easily be lost because it's like being fish out of water to try to figure out. We know how to do that for others because they come to us, they talk to us about what their hurts and their pains, their deficits are in their lives. But if we're not used to doing that, how do we do that? How do you begin to all of a sudden, you know, develop a relationship, a deep enough, an intimate relation enough to be able to talk to somebody about what it is that you're feeling, you're going through, your isolation, your pain, uh, if you haven't been doing it right along. So it, it's just, it's important to, to develop that. We know how helpful it is for others because we, we help them through that. How do we help ourselves? Uh, and how do we take courage and have courage enough to identify that and to share it? And usually, if you look at our lives, isn't it through the challenges and the trials and tribulations that come our way, uh, that we come out of it a lot stronger, a lot more closer to God, and dependent on Him uh, in so many different ways. And, and even if we begin to pray a bit more or put that, because we have no excuse now, right? In, in terms right. Of, of scheduling that, shall we say. But through prayer, if we open ourselves up and ask ourselves, who is it? God, who, who can I speak to? Who can I see before me? Who can I uh, begin to trust more implicitly? And, uh, and you know, the fact that I follow that, that strain, shall we say, it would be a very helpful thing. Thank you very much, Father Chris and Father Nick, for your time and for your thoughts and for your offering to the clergy of our archdiocese here today. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you for asking. I'd like to thank you all for joining us on this, our third episode of our Q series, Connecting, Understanding, and Equipping our Orthodox Clergy.